Following the new growth models, what we have seen, in fact, is a tidal wave of empirical research which tries to understand what are the factors which will contribute towards, first of all, generation of research and development, the generation of new ideas, either being captured through the research and development expenditure or through the patents or its variants and how then it will contribute to economic growth. This vast literature, again, uh, try to uh, understand through this empirical methods uh, the, the role that technology will play in terms of generating economic growth for the different countries. Now, this literature, if you look at it, is rather vast. Moreover, we find that many a time that the results are also uh, sensitive or conditioned upon the, the data, whether you are talking a long timer series or short time series, the number of the countries which we have been uh, looking at. And uh, one common uh, conclusion that does emerge that the growth seems to be heterogeneous among countries, starting from low level of GDP per capita. With some countries, they will fall, they are falling behind, and some are being able to catch up as such. Now, if you look at the, the discussion on a solo model, that model essentially predicts about uh, convergence because whatever would be the uh, you know capital stock you will start with over a period of a time, the tendency is that towards going for a steady state. Now, if that is the case, you will find that when it comes to endogenous growth model, they talk about the differences in the countries in terms of the steady state. And uh, Professor Jones has also critiqued, uh, you know, this uh, endogenous growth model because highlighting that if you look at United States and European Union during 1980s and 90s, what happened was that the R&D based endogenous growth model, they predicted that the growth rate for an economy, uh, it will be approximated by TFP growth. And it depends on the number of the researchers who are now being employed in R&D as such. And there they have seen that a steady increase in the letter, that is uh, uh, the steady increase in the number of the researchers who are employed. But when you look at the total factor productivity growth, it did not display a very clear trend. It is indeed, it is it fluctuates widely across the uh, you know uh, countries, and um, so does this constitute a kind of a relation, uh, you know, evidence against the relationship between uh, innovation and economic growth is the question that is being uh, asked. So there, uh, Professor Jones has suggested that what we can look for are alternative models, which differs from R and D based endogenous growth models based on coming from the works of Robert uh, Romer and Grossman and Helpman uh, by trying to come up with a different specification for the invention process. And uh, there is a need to understand that uh, whereas this original R&D based model that they assume that the growth rate of the knowledge merely depend upon the number of the R&D workers in a linear way, he highlighted that there are decreasing returns to research and uh, development and labor as such because uh, it, it is based on the idea that the first of all the most obvious ideas will be discovered and as a result it will become harder and harder to come up with the newer ideas as such and in this so called a semi endogenous growth model you will find that that uh, endogenous uh, growth is only possible when the uh, population grows and uh, it also again kind of a put a limit in terms of the uh, the growth that will come through the technology and but coming only from the involvement of the researchers as has been postulated in the Romer's work as such. Try and understand the critique of, of Jones of the Romer's model. Again, uh, the inno invention process, if, if, if you will try to bring in more complexity in the process of the generation of the innovation, clearly you will be able to get better uh, outcome in terms of its uh, implications for the growth. Now here, the assumed relationship that has been talked about was with the R&D labor, the number of the innovations and the resulting economic growth, which again uh, is, is based on the assumption of a very uh, equilibrium behavior and a weak uh, uncertainty. But if you look at more a non less mechanistic and evolutionary uh, growth world, then you will find that innovation, R&D and growth, they are indeed linked through a much less rigid relationship. And there is a possibility that uh, this may, they will change over a period of a time. There might be more radical technological development be happening at some point or not so at the another point. So, in this view, the specific relationship when you will look at, uh, you know, whether you are looking at R&D or whether you are talking about the TFP, uh, there may be, uh, need, there is a need to specify it in a much better way. 
the same question from the point of view of the developing economies the, the idea for them is whether they will be able to catch up or not whether they will be able to catch up let us say automatically or whether they will be able to they are needed to undertake certain specific interventions a investment etc in order for the convergence so that is an important question for them here if you look at uh, the work of uh, professor gershaw kron he talks about the new institutional instrument uh, instruments that are required in order to support the catching up with the newer technologies that are coming up maybe in the rest of the world he talks about the need to create specific uh, institutions that will help in the absorption of the newer technology one of his fo focus has been the uh, the financial institutions like banks in order to uh, support the innovation activities and absorption of the newer technologies but that doesn't limit their itself the literature also talk about the role of social capability and absorptive capacity particularly from the point of view of the developing countries in order to support the catching up activities here the idea is that the developing countries they are following and adapting the best practices in and technology in international context and as a result in order to ensure that they are able to follow them they would have to bring in capabilities within their own country so these capabilities are of two essentially aspects one is a social capability another is a absorptive capacity so this social capability coming up from the work of abramovitz in 1986 essentially relates to the technical competence experience in the organization and management of large scale enterprises financial institutions and market for mobilizing capital on large scale stable government and that is likely to support the adoption of the newer top technologies apart from that the next one is with respect to absorptive capacity rosto highlighted that economic growth depends upon the rate of absorption of existing and unfolding stock of relevant knowledge the rate of absorption depends upon the availability of both trained men and capital if you remember when we talked about the market for technology and we highlighted that even for the the company who is now taking the technology from somebody else it whether they will be able to integrate that within their own organization or not will depend upon their own capabilities to absorb it so now the 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 idea essentially comes from the work of kohan and levinthal who has discussed it at a firm level they talk about it as an ability to recognize the value of new external knowledge and to assimilate it and apply it within their organization for a commercial end in that context the uh, the research and development that has been conducted that means the expenditures that has been made towards research and development are going to play a very important role and clearly it also leads to the path dependence or building up with the existing technologies getting maybe locked up with the existing technologies to an extent now this idea which has been created from the point of view of one company can now be extended to include what will happen at an economy so clearly the existing level of the technology the existing information the knowledge the capability to use that will also influence what all the country will be able to absorb will be able to take up as such so there also you will find that that the the existing level of maybe the research and development the stock of research and development the extent of the patents that the company country has will play a very significant role in terms of their capability which will lead to the absorption of the newer ideas now the the discussion on catching up uh, if you particularly look at begins with the um, the german case and uh, post uh, uh, post world war 2 and uh, it does talk about the german and the japanese case the focus for our concern could be the newly industrializing countries in asia professor kim and lal has done extensive work on the technological capabilities being developed in the uh, newly uh, industrialized countries in asia and we will have a uh, discussion on that so there professor kim has identified that there is a need to develop technological capability so what is technological capability the idea there is the country should be able to make effective use of the technological knowledge in efforts to assimilate use adapt and change the existing technology there are four major capabilities that are required in order to do that there is a need for a production capability 
investment capability and an innovation capability innovation capability will support the assimilation activities adaptation activities that are now going to require investment activity or capabilities are going to support both the production as well as the innovation capabilities and then clearly once you have that technology over a period of a time when you want to now maybe mass produce clearly the production capabilities would be needed so then capabilities can be grouped under physical investment human capital and technological efforts of a country what professor lal has done has in fact constructed a technology effort index which is an uh, offshoot of a very widely discussed this particular concept of technological capability and this efforts then the uh, your know, development of the capabilities as such and this what does this technology effort include it includes a broad spectrum of production engineering design research work by firms and such efforts can be then lead to their producing uh, production efficiency and export activity as such so when professor lal talks about this technological effort of a country and he highlights that it depends upon the dynamism that is there in terms of technological development particularly the type of national policies which are now going to improve the factor markets influence the incentive environment what do we mean by this it means that now the country if the particular country has and different policies which may support the creation of more skilled labor let us say and create an uh, environment where people are incentivized to go for a, a you know upskilling or for a higher uh, let us say education then that will support the dynamism of the technological development in that particular country so this again is in the context uh, one can view this uh, particularly this absorption of the technologies once again linking it to an uh, you know your national innovation system approach we have already studied and looked at that how all important uh, economic social and political organizations and other factor influence this development diffusion and use of innovation so in this case in this particular idea of absorption of the newer technologies coming once again from the developing economies point of view there are various activities within a system that can support those activities for example the research basic developmental engineering the implementation which will again link to the production technologies the consumer whether they are able to uh, you know relate to the product and because they are going to be the end user the kind of linkages that will be there between the complementary knowledge or not and clearly the education so when you look at this set of the whole activities which are there which we have discussed in terms of the national innovation system also these activities extend beyond the r&d system they include important inputs to the r&d activity as well as to the r&d output now why we are talking about these activities in term of a developing countries not only from the point of view of the development of the new technologies please understand here it may not initially at a very lower level of a development such activities may not be leading to a creation of the new to the world technologies but for the use of the existing innovations to absorb them adapt them and then learn from them and kindly and then go forward we have done uh, an example of hyundai where we have seen that that uh, you know certain companies will initially get the product which is available internationally will uh, dismantle it learn from it and maybe over a period of a time develop capability so that is being done at the firm level what we are also now talking that in this uh you know uh, endeavor to grow economically over a period of a time countries might be expected to invest in developing these kind of a capabilities which will lead to the or contribute towards their economic growth one another important question which is there from the point of view of the developing and the lead least developed economies in the countries is that what are the potential sources through which they can get this knowledge this point also we have already discussed where you highlighted that clearly migration is an important source where you will find that where you will find that the sum of the labor from the developing economies and least developed economies they shift towards the developed economies learn there and they might come back to their home countries and then contribute so migration is clearly a very important way through which the ideas travel across the globe 
then we have looked at the activities of the multinational enterprises where such enterprises either export their product or undertake foreign direct investment through maybe a joint venture or a wholly owned subsidiary they may also license their technologies for the mass production in the developing economies or in the least developed economies and once again could be providing the technology either through a codified or through the presence of the tacit knowledge then we have seen that uh, the other the other uh, sources may include backward and the forward linkages that may develop with the original equipment manufacturer also in that entire context when the knowledge is present different sources are available through which the information can or technology can now be seen can be absorbed can be learned capabilities can be developed literature once again highlight the role of the absorptive capacity to do so so there clearly the emphasis from the work of uh, professor freeman where he talks about innovation is clearly as critical for the sustainable economic growth not only for the developed economies which are engaged in a very a uh, formal research and development by uh, uh, by establishing these large r and d labs and patenting the outcome but for the uh, but also for the developing economies it has been pointed out that this is important for the improvement of the quality of law of life and for the long term conservation of the resources now here access to more and a new type of goods and services they will lead to a better financial well being and they can also enable the people to do things which they have not been able to do so far this you can see with the recent gadgets that you have with you uh, with uh, most people which they use them and how they help them improving their living conditions now a uh, very interesting work by medicine has pointed out that roughly for years uh, you know 1000 to about 1820 there was a little progress in the world per capita in spite of only a moderate population growth and the world was you know kind of a stuck between this malthusian uh, malthusian cycle of resource scarcity without sustained productivity growth but the last 200 years they have in fact witnessed a great growth of both human population and the economic welfare and uh, this short 200 period again started with the first industrial revolution and has continued through successive major industrial revolution defined by major technological shock across the different phases so clearly there is a link when we talk about the the change in the technologies that are available and the modern economic life which is rather comfortable and uh, easy as as compared to the earlier time so learning from that from the developed in countries point of view clearly investment in the research and development investment in the building of the capabilities through which the new ideas are not only generated but also are translated into the commercial products which reaches the masses become very very important now here if we look at this particular report from oecd on innovation for development they have done this different kind of a categorization where the resources can be spent by the different countries at the different stages of the development on uh, on uh, research and development for instance the the report highlights that the developing or a low income countries and emerging and middle income countries they can focus their attention on the adopt, adoption when which requires adaptation they need to also respond to the specific local conditions for the outcome so when you are thinking about agriculture then the new plant varieties effort which will lead to you know mineral extraction maybe in a, the example which is given is of a, a country like Ch uh, chilean uh, copper, copper industry to satisfy the local needs apart from that the innovation they also needs to be more inclusive because they need to engage with they need to uh, you know cater to the requirements of the low and the middle income household we have seen that innovations particularly in indian case the grassroots innovation the mobile banking service and nano cars etc was designed to need to to cater to the needs and uh, requirements of the specific income household then cut the mainly middle income countries and there are also some opportunities for developing and low income countries in such countries you will find that maybe the building up of the innovation capabilities will also be important so if you are at a very lower level then context specification become very important at a little higher level when you are reaching the middle level middle income level the op, the uh, 
the most important need would be to avoid the middle income trap if that is the case then a sustained effort toward developing uh, innovation capabilities would be very important a very important case in this case of a korea which has increased their r&d efforts in 1990s and then were able to grow also then such countries all need to focus on the environmental health and the social challenges and for example how to conserve soil the soil conditions will be very different across the countries what kind of a technologies can support uh, you know enhancing the fertility in those cases also you know so these are some of the examples which can be looked at apart from doing this there can also be effort towards building up the niche competencies some kind of areas where the comparative advantage of the countries can be built up like you know colombia and ecuadorian flour industry malaysian palm oil sector etc further in the emerging economies and the middle income countries after initial progress the focus would be to climb the value ladder to be a part of the global value uh, chain for example automotive industry in malaysia india software etc uh, industry which are now on the way to become maybe or becoming very close to the technological leader of the world so keep keeping competitiveness in the frontier industries is again very important you will find that the newly industrialized economies like japan south korea and taiwan they focused on the semiconductor sectors the areas which were really uh, you know thriving at that point of a time so identifying all those frontier industries also become very very important and then clearly investing in those contribute towards the growth so here we have seen a relationship between the global innovation index and the gdp per capita so this global innovation index is the uh, uh, you know outcome from the world intellectual property right organization and it has various um, Uh, you know parameters on which they compute this gii and uh, they have roughly 80 indicators uh, which are now being grouped as innovation inputs and innovation output and what they trying to do in this index is essentially capture the multi dimensional facet of the innovation which is much beyond the simple r and d expenditure and the patent as such so here if you look at it clearly there is a relationship between the gdp per capita and the innovation which is being conducted in the countries as such the big green bubble belongs to india which you find is that it is somewhere around the middle of the way because we have seen that that from to 2020 to 2022 there has been a considerable change in our uh, you know global innovation index rank we have moved from 48 to 40 and in terms of innovation input we have moved from 57 to 42 and from innovation output we have moved from 45 to 39 so you can see that it is indeed Uh, uh that india is an innovation leader in the lower middle income group some of the major areas in which india has a specific strength includes uh, your entrepreneurship policies culture the graduates which come from science and engineering global corporate r and d investors finance for startups venture capital receive domestic industry diversification domestic market scale labor productivity and ict service exports so with this we will uh, finish this particular topic thank you